Hey, everybody, welcome to the Addiction Unlimited podcast, where you get to learn everything you want to know about addiction and recovery. I'm your host, Angela Pugh, co founder of Kansas City Recovery, life coach, and recovering alcoholic. To learn more about me, you can listen to episode zero on your podcast app or find us on the web at addictionunlimited.com. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Addiction Unlimited podcast. I'm your host, Angela Pugh, and I'm super excited to say we have a new review on Apple Podcasts. I love it when I get new reviews. It makes my day. It's so fun. I get a little email that tells me. So the headline of this one This is from, I'm going to butcher this because, you know, people's usernames are not their actual names usually. So, okay, Nono Slobo, that's what we're going with. And the headline says, great stuff. And I got five stars, which is amazing. And it says, it's so nice to hear other tactics and ideas to stay sober that aren't only AA language. It's a great supplement to 12 Steps. And Nono Slobo, I could not agree more. Yes. Thank you for taking the time to leave a review. I'm so grateful for that. And I totally agree with that statement about having some guidance that isn't AA language. Um, you know, I am an aa and I love the program and the steps. And one of the things I struggled with early on was all of the lingo and the cliches. And I remember sitting in the rooms at a meeting and people would be talking and they would use the lingo and I just had no idea what they were talking about. It was really a struggle for me. And much later, obviously when I got a sponsor, that's when it really started to make a lot more sense because then I had somebody to ask, right? I could just say, what the hell is this person talking about when they say yada, yada, yada. And I remember calling my sponsor and being like, okay, I need to talk about this, but don't AA me. I just need you to talk to me, not in AA words, (laughs) because sometimes when I would call my sponsor, I mean, he would do the same thing. And I totally get all the cliches and the lingo now, and it is all accurate and awesome. But I also appreciate just speaking in regular language. And you know, one of my goals in my podcast and in my life is to break down all the weird stigmas and weird beliefs people have about AA. And I think sometimes the lingo makes us seem even more weird. You know, for those of us in it, those one-liners are a simple way to make a huge statement. You know, I can say one day at a time and in an instant, it puts things in perspective and it spurs this whole train of thought of like, okay, Angela, you're getting way ahead of yourself. Stay in today, figure out what to do just for today. But instead of one of my friends saying that whole spiel, they can just say one day at a time and I know exactly how to use it and practice it and reel myself in. But I do absolutely get it. And I like speaking in regular language. I think it's much more relatable. And for me, it feels like it cuts down the time frame on that learning curve, you know, because like I said, when I was new, I sat in those rooms for a long time and I just felt like I had no idea what anybody was talking about. So it it's nice, of course, now being this far in, I understand most of it. It's also very subjective, you know, how I understand some of those one-liners, my thoughts about it might be a little bit different than somebody else's thoughts about it. So it's always fascinating to hear different people and their beliefs too. The other issue with using one-liners in the lingo is that not everyone understands the deeper meaning of those sayings. It took me a long time to get to the true meaning of those sayings and to be able to apply them to my life. And they are brilliant, but it's probably a little more advanced AA stuff. And I can't expect non-AA people or newly sober people to understand the terminology the way I understand it. And that's why I really don't use it too often. My desire is to connect with people. And when people don't understand what you are talking about, you immediately lose their attention and the opportunity to connect and help them. So again, no, no, Slobo. Thank you so much for the great review. I know you guys are all busy with life and kids and staying sober, and it isn't easy to remember to jump on the podcast app and leave a review, and I truly appreciate it. 
So let's get on with today's episode. Last week, we talked about different things you can do to deal with anxiety and how to start to neutralize it and break it down. And I told you this week we would talk about guilt and shame. These are the three things you struggle with more than anything when you are trying to get and stay sober. And that's why I wanted to address them directly. I know you are struggling. I know you feel exhausted and overwhelmed and completely lost as to what to do to make it stop. And I've been there too. You've heard me talk about my anxiety on other episodes. And at times, my anxiety is debilitating. I've had a lot of practice breaking it down. I'm pretty good at talking myself off the ledge now, but there are still situations that get the best of me, and I still have times that I isolate to an unhealthy degree. The difference today is I can recognize when I'm being a little bit unhealthy, and I trust myself to take the necessary action to correct it. And, you know, I went through this maybe... I don't know, four or five years ago, I was at a really tough time, had just been through a hard breakup. And not that the actual breakup was hard. That was very easy and amicable. And he's a wonderful person. And, you know, we got through that pretty easily. But there's a lot of stuff that goes on when you split, even when it's amicable, right? There's always disappointment. And there's always anger. And there's always hurt feelings and sadness. And you know, sadness of the future you thought you were going to have. There's just a lot of stuff going on. And I kind of sunk into a spot, you know, and I moved into my new apartment and was trying to sort of start my life over. Um, Obviously very different because I had lived with this person and, and my life looked very different, right? So I'm in my new apartment, I'm starting over. And what I noticed was I, I just was isolating and I had isolated to a point that I was so caught up in my own head and feeling overwhelmed and confused as to what to do. Like, you know, my business, I put on hold for this relationship. So I was kind of having to start from ground zero, not only in my life in a new home, but also kind of restarting my business. And I was much older, obviously, and just thinking about like, how do I do this? Like, what do I do? You know, like I don't, I don't know. I just felt like I didn't know what to do in any piece of my life. Like I just didn't know how to get started to putting it all back together. And what happened is I isolated so much. I literally was just not leaving my house. And then I caught myself getting a little weird about leaving my house. Like I was almost working myself into some agoraphobia. For those of you that don't know, agoraphobic means uh, fear of leaving your house. And every time I would think about like going to a meeting or doing something, I would just talk myself out of it. And I'd be like, I just want to stay here. You know, like it's safe here. I can close the door to the rest of the world. And like I was burying my head in the sand trying to pretend that the world wasn't happening out there. But when I noticed that I was creating this fear of going out into the world, that's when I knew I had to take some action. And that action for me was I called uh, my old sponsor, Kevin, and I called Kevin and I called probably three or four other people and I told him exactly what was going on. And I was like, I need I need a coffee date this week. I need to be out. And I just scheduled things to do with these four people to get me out of the house, right? So I had that accountability. And I do trust myself to do it, right? That's one of the greatest things at this stage of my sobriety is I really do trust myself implicitly. I know I might not self-correct quickly all the time, but I know I will do what I need to do to ensure that I am healthy and happy. And that's one of the things I really want to get into today is trust in yourself. I want you to remember all day, every day, addiction thrives on you not feeling good about yourself. And we do at least 50 things a day that we aren't super proud of. Whether it's hitting the snooze button instead of getting out of bed or dodging a phone call you know you need to take or putting something off you need to get done, snapping at your spouse or your kids because you're tired and irritable, 
all of these tiny micro decisions we make throughout our day chip away at us feeling good about ourselves and trusting ourselves to do the right thing. And this is how we end up feeling defeated and overwhelmed. You spend years making these micro decisions, not leaving the house on time, or stopping for coffee when you're already running late, not finding a new job when you hate the one you have, not figuring out how to earn more money when you don't have enough. All of these things add up to us not believing in ourselves and not trusting ourselves. And above and beyond anything else in the world, I have to believe in and trust in myself. I have to to trust me to get up when I need to get up. I have to trust me to answer the phone when the bill collectors are calling because it's my responsibility to handle my life. I have to trust me to leave an unhealthy relationship even though it hurts like hell. I have to trust me to earn money when I'm broke or to get a better job when I have one I don't like. I have to trust me. And when I don't trust me, my self-esteem takes a hit. My confidence in myself deteriorates. And what do you think happens when I feel shitty about myself? My addiction starts to celebrate. You guys heard the episode, Don't Poke the Bear. Well, when you make all these micro crappy decisions, each one of them is poking the bear. Then when you start beating yourself up for the tiny crappy decisions, the bear starts to wake up because those negative thoughts and negative self-talk is what he can feed on. And all of this stuff plays together and plays into the effing up of your mindset and keeping you off balance, which is, again, exactly what addiction thrives on. I would never tell you that I'm proud of the person I was in my alcoholism. I was so self-absorbed. I was incapable of thinking about anything or anyone else. I spent my days either drunk or hungover, manipulating every person and every situation to fit what I wanted. I lied to people. I used people for companionship and to relieve boredom. I was a jerk. I was irresponsible. I borrowed money from people with no intention of paying them back, which is stealing. I drove drunk every day of my life. I stole money and literally like the list could go on. But what I can tell you is those are not things I would ever do in my right mind. When I was that person, I was very broken. I have trauma and drama and consistent heartbreak because I chose bad people to date and was constantly lied to and cheated on. And in turn, my self-esteem was at zero. I was broken and sad and sick. That's why I drank the way I did. And that's why I felt like shit all the time. And as long as I felt like shit, my alcoholism could thrive. The bear was wide awake and partying his little buns off, loving life, feeding on my pain and insecurity. And once I got sober, I felt some guilt for sure. I was not proud of my behavior. I wasn't proud of my actions. And this is what I want you to pay attention to. Again, I would not have behaved that way in my right mind. And in my right mind doesn't only mean sober, but it means as a happy, healthy, well-adjusted, functioning human being, right? I was sick, not only drunk, but mentally and emotionally, I was very sick. And I think this is what trips you up. You start to believe that who you are in your drunken life is who you actually are in your core. Like when the bear is wide awake and wreaking havoc in your drunken mind, that's your true character. That's what everybody starts to believe. And that is simply not the case. I had to remember that I was a whole human being before I was a drunk. I was kind and loving and generous and in many ways, I was all of those things even when I was drunk. You know, no one on the planet is 100% good or 100% bad. So why do we convince ourselves that we are so terrible <laughs> when we're drunk? There were many moments in my drunken life that I was still kind and generous and loving. But before that, I was an amazing person. I was a great sister and daughter. I was a great friend to my friends. I was funny and loyal and an overall wonderful person. And unfortunately, I was hijacked by alcohol. 
alcohol is the bad guy, not me. I'm still that wonderful person I was before I ever had a drink. That's who I am in my core. And so are you. You are a good parent, a good spouse. You are a good employee. You're a good kid to your parents and a good sibling to your siblings. You are driven and dedicated and supportive and overall loving. Remember that. Drunk you is not the real you. The deterioration of your integrity and character are because of alcohol and how it breaks you down slowly but surely. It is not you. And the first step is putting some of that responsibility on booze and taking it off yourself. Remember who you were before you were drunk, before you were a regular drinker. Dig up that person and start focusing on being that again. And leave your guilt and shame behind with your drunk person. I totally separate the drunk me from the sober me. The drunk one holds all the bullshit and drama and despicable behavior because I would never make those choices as a sober person. I would not have deteriorated to that broken sick person if I didn't have alcohol helping me down the ladder into the abyss. Getting lost in that guilt and shame over the things you did when you were hijacked is not going to help or change anything. And the best way to counteract that is to take action. It won't do you any good to get trapped in your head with the committee chattering nonstop about all the effed up things you did. You cannot spend alone time with the committee. You have to take action to distract yourself from listening to the committee and give the committee something else to talk about. This means you start doing good and positive things. If you feel bad about bad behavior, your best defense is to do good behavior. How can you be helpful to the people around you? Do something nice for your spouse. Give your mom a call and tell her that you love her. Do something fun and amazing that will make your kids squeal with joy. Take a leisurely walk with your spouse and dog. Pack a note in your kid's school bag. Make cookies or stop and pick up a special treat for your family on your way home. Volunteer at your church or at your AA group or at your favorite charity. Sign up for a 5K. Call two people every single day and ask them how they are doing without saying anything about yourself. That's a big one. I have a lot of my clients do that call two people every day and just ask them how they're doing and don't talk about yourself. Don't say anything about you. Don't say anything about your day, your family, nothing. Sit and listen to somebody else talk about themselves. We get really, really engulfed in ourselves, people. That committee runs our lives if we let it. And that's why we have to do things to distract from the committee so it will start to get quieter. And then we have to do things that gives the committee new information to talk about, right? Right now, the committee is in there in your head with that bear, and all they're talking about is all the effed up stuff, all the bad stuff you did, and what a bad person you are. That's all they have to talk about right now. You got to give them some new information. You got to give them some new stuff to talk about. To counteract guilt and shame, to rebuild your self-confidence and self-esteem, you must do esteemable acts. Do as many things as possible to feel good about yourself and make those around you feel good about you. That's how you break down guilt and shame. This is what we talk about in AA when we make amends, right? Making amends isn't so much about apologizing for the things I did. It's more about telling the people I did wrong that I won't be that person anymore. Then the focus has to shift to not being that person anymore, I have to do things differently. I have to shift my thinking to others instead of focusing on myself. Even obsessing over your guilt and shame is being selfish. It's in the past. You cannot change the past, but you can create a different future. Remind yourself of who you are in your core, all those good things you are, and you were more of before drinking became front and center in your life. Remember who you really are. These are the things we do in the recovery recipe. We shift that mindset and create new habits and we learn to take action to work against the negatives as we grow and heal. 
And for those of you that haven't gotten the recovery recipe, I'll put a link in the show notes. It's at addictionunlimited.com forward slash recovery recipe, all one word, addictionunlimited.com forward slash recovery recipe. And again, I'll put a link down in the show notes. Anxiety is usually about overthinking about the future, right? Shame and guilt come from overthinking about the past. And you don't drive your car by looking in the rearview mirror, right? So why would you live your life that way? Shift your focus to the road ahead and what you want that to look like. Who is the person you want to be starting right now? Is that a person of integrity, honesty, sober, brave, responsible, dependable? Then start being that person. Stop focusing on the past and be in your new self, this version 2.0, best version you've ever been, and put your energy into showing that person to all of those people who love you and support you. That's how you counteract shame and guilt. Be the new you. Don't just think about it or dream about it. Do it. And for those of you that want more support and whether it's group coaching or one-on-one mentorship with me, I'll put that link in the show notes as well. You can find all my coaching options at addictionunlimited.com forward slash coaching. There are a few different options at different price points. So I have something to offer everyone. And that again is at addictionunlimited.com forward slash coaching. That'll be in the show notes. And that's what I want you to focus on this week. What action can you take today to start showing yourself and those around you that you are becoming a new person. You're putting these old behaviors behind you and starting to practice new behaviors that are strong and good. And if you want a strong community that is super supportive and totally private, join our Facebook group. I'm blown away at how amazing our members are in the group. They are so kind and supportive of one another. And that's also where all the announcements of everything I do and different coaching things and recovery recipe, all that kind of stuff, that's where announcements come out first. Um, Announcements about weekly group coaching topics and offers, all of that happen first in the Facebook group. So I also link that in the show notes, um, facebook.com forward slash groups addiction unlimited. It is totally private. So shift your focus, people. Remember who you were before you started drinking. It is imperative that you remember the person you were before. And listen, if you were a selfish, no good jerk before you started drinking, this is a great opportunity to turn that around too. One of the greatest things we can do for ourselves is stop thinking about ourselves. (laughs) Stop thinking about the bad choices that we've made. Stop thinking about the mistakes that we've made, right? In AA, when we talk about amends, you know, you sit down with people and you actually make amends. And for me, this was my absolute most favorite part of all the steps was amends because I felt so strong and powerful having those conversations because they're hard. You know, it's not easy to sit down with somebody and say, you know, I did this and said this and made this decision and it hurt you. And I'm so sorry that that happened. And I am not going to be that person anymore. Those conversations are hard and they're not always received well. At the same time, amends was the step where I got the absolute greatest relief and spiritual inside change in myself. Because I've sat down and had those conversations And I just felt so strong. And I remember walking away from a girlfriend I had met to make amends with her. And I remember walking away from our meeting and I thought, you know what, man, if I can do this, I can do anything. Like literally there's nothing I can't handle. If I can sit down and do this really hard stuff, there's nothing I can't handle. And another part of amends, we talk about living amends. And living amends aren't things that happen in words, but they're things that happen in our action, right? For example, when I was drunk, I would blow through all my money. My mom had her own business and she would pay me to come work for her and she would pay me cash. Now, sometimes I was a really fantastic worker. A lot of times I was a really crappy, worthless worker because I was hungover and felt like crap and I was crabby and I was a jerk. So one of the things I did as living amends once I was sober is I would go work for my mom for free. 
and just pay some of that time back, right? That's living amends. Living amends are all the little tiny things that you can do just to be nice to the people around you. Not asking for anything in return, not doing something to get validation or have someone tell you, thank you, you're so great, but just doing it because you want to do it, because you're a good person. And anything that we can do that is not about ourselves is really healthy for us, right? So like I said, I just listed all those things a little while ago, like all the things that you can do um, that would be living amends, you know, just to get outside yourself. And that stuff is really, really important. You know, anything nice you can do. Volunteer for an extra day of carpool or babysit for somebody without charging them. I don't know. There's a million things that you could do, but that's living amends. And it's one of my favorite things. And it is one of the greatest things I could do to break down my guilt and shame over the person I was before. Because what's happening in that living amends and being of service, right? Volunteering, giving your time, giving your love, giving your attention to people. Those are the things that start to rebuild you. And those are the things. It's hard for the committee to sit around in your head with that damn bear talking about what a crappy human you are when you're actually doing really good human things. You see what I'm saying? That's what I mean when I say give them something else to talk about. Do really good things. Give them something else to talk about. It's hard to feel bad about yourself when you're being a good person. That's what I want you to think about. What are some things you can do? Living amends, being of service, get outside of yourself and do good things to give that committee and that damn bear something new to talk about. Okay, I hope you guys have a fantastic day. I hope to see you in the Facebook group. All the links I mentioned will be in the show notes, or if you need them, message me. I'm happy to send you whatever you need. Um, Have a great day, you guys. I'll see you next week. You've reached the end of another great episode of the Addiction Unlimited podcast, candid and honest conversation about addiction and recovery. Be sure to visit us at addictionunlimited.com to join the conversation and access show notes and links to everything we talked about. Love this episode? Please take 30 seconds to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes to help us improve and give you the information you want. Thanks for listening. See you next week.